and take your seats. Please welcome to the stage the Chinese Arts Alliance of Nashville.
Good morning, and uh, let's start with some thanks to all of the performers in the Chinese Arts Alliance of Nashville. <laughs> Fabulous. <clears throat> it was a little scary there for a moment. Uh, we were almost bitten, I think, but, uh, but it, it, it worked. So, um, I want to just also just uh, take a moment to thank all of the performers who have been with us for the last uh, several days here in Nashville. And I personally would love everybody to turn to the, uh, your right and say thanks to uh, Chuck and Jim and the sound crew for the fabulous job that they have done here. So it is, it's great to see uh, all of you here uh, this morning. It's actually amazing to find myself here after uh, all of the music and the dancing and the doing up of Nashville in style that we've been doing and you were doing last night. And now to continue this uh, multi-day festival of idea exchange, we have this closing session, which I'm very, very excited about. So to close out this year's convention, we're looking to the future. And uh, we're looking at that future with a keynote panel that brings together three uh, young, emerging, uh, various stages of career uh, artists uh, into a conversation about art, society, and a vision for tomorrow. And one of the things I want to say is that uh, we, we find young artists in many, many different ways, some through you uh, and some uh, through organizations like the Great Sphinx Organization, uh, the uh, Young Arts Organization, Scholastic, organizations that we work with. And, um, some of the artists here we've met first through those organizations. As a reminder, we're live streaming, and we're live streaming this session uh, on our YouTube channel, which can be found at youtube.com slash Americans for the Arts. To lead this discussion, please welcome to the stage in a second, Jamie Bennett. Jamie's the Executive Director of Art Place America, and as the Executive Director of Art Place, Jamie works to promote the inclusion of the arts in community, uh, in community development, in community development strategies, making him the perfect fit to moderate this panel. Um, previously, Jamie was Chief of Staff and Director of Public Affairs at the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as Chief of Staff at uh, our, one, of your, one of our member organizations, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the Agnes Gunn Foundation, and uh, he was also in that same role to the president of Columbia University. He is a consummate believer in the power of art to create positive change. He's also been a really personal friend to the local arts agency movement in his role at the National Endowment for the Arts and to our organization in helping us envision some big leaps and some big changes that are going on uh, right now that I've talked about over the last few days, like the local arts agency uh, visioning that we're, we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. And in addition to that, he's a fun guy. He's somebody that you want to hang out with. Um, and you'll see this in person. So please welcome to the stage the great Jamie Bennett. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I actually just want to uh, begin by just saying a word about Bob, uh, because as he mentioned, I had been at the NEA for four years, and everyone who knows Bob at all knows that Bob is everywhere. He's indefatigable. He just can't be stopped. He's everywhere doing everything. But having been inside the NEA, I can tell you that Bob does actually far more 
than any of you even get to see. So one of the great things about being out of government is that I can now speak more honestly and more freely. And really thank you, Bob, uh, for everything that you've done visibly and behind the scenes for all of us. So in addition to that, I also, today is a special day, and I just want to acknowledge any of the fathers who are in the room. So would any of the fathers put up their hands and let us wish you a happy Father's Day. So as Bob mentioned, I'm lucky enough to be the executive director of an organization called Art Place. And fundamentally, what we're about is positioning art and culture as a core sector of every community in this country. So we believe that any time a mayor seats a conversation about the future of her community, art and culture should be one of, the, one of the sectors that's at the table. Housing, transportation, art and culture, public safety, open space. We're fundamentally a part of every community uh, in the United States. And there are some things that we do, that we as the arts bring to the table that other sectors don't. And I've talked about this at some length, and, and if anyone's interested, I can uh, connect you with the research and, and um, connect you with some of the more specifics. But generally, the things that we do in the arts that strengthen communities have to do with increasing quality of life and driving stable communities. So there's research that the Knight Foundation has done with Gallup that shows the role that art and culture plays in attachment to community. There's work that Alika Wally at the Field Museum in Chicago that has done that shows the role that art and culture plays in social cohesion. Mark Stern at the University of Pennsylvania has talked about the role of art and culture in civic engagement. Some of the work that the NEA is doing with Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center talks about the role of art and culture in uh, personal resiliency and in um, society resiliency. And in addition to all of that, art is one of the few community assets that exists everywhere. Not every community has access to the waterfront. Not every community has a great public transportation system. Not every community is lucky enough to be anchored by a university. But every community has art and culture. And since it's an asset that exists everywhere, it's an asset that I think we need to activate as we're building our communities. And one of the things that's really interesting to me as I've come into this work is the disconnect that exists in many people's minds about where art comes from. So I think there are many people in this room that are familiar with USA Artists, a fabulous organization that gives $50,000 grants to individual artists. And the genesis story of that organization was a piece of national research that actually found that 98% of Americans valued the role of art in their lives, 27% valued the role of artists. So I think there's a big disconnect, and it's what led to USA Artists' tagline that art comes from artists. And I think we have a fair amount uh, that we can learn from the food movement and some of the stuff that they've done around the sort of know your farmer, know your, know your food work to help children understand that steak doesn't come from the grocery store. Steak comes from an animal that, you know, comes from there. So I'm really excited, I'm really energized, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and be asked to moderate this closing session with three artists. So as I think is clear to all of you who know anything about me or anything about my background, I am not an artist. And whenever I'm on stage with artists, I think of the movie Grease, and there's that great scene where the principal says that if you can't be an athlete, you can at least be an athletic supporter. <laughs> so I'm up here as an artistic supporter. So I'm lucky enough to be here as a jockstrap for the arts, which is a really exciting role to be. So as such, my job, I think, is to end quickly and get out of the way and let some of our artist colleagues do what it is they do best. So I hope uh, that you will all join me in beginning this session by welcoming a bassist, um, composer, educator, and activist from San Francisco, gentleman who founded and leads the Marcus Shelby Orchestra. So please join me in making welcome Marcus Shelby. How y'all doing? Good. All right. We in uh, Nashville, so I got to play a blues. Thank you. 
I couldn't fit my drummer in my suitcase <laughs> coming from San Francisco, so I'm gonna need y'all help. Two and four. Very much. Thank you. I think I was about nine years old when I first heard the sound of the blues. I was in church. They didn't call it the blues in church. <laughs> At least my, my grandfather didn't call it the blues in church. But that's what it was. It was that sound, that expressiveness, sometimes pain, sometimes joy, sometimes happiness, but certainly a feeling that was personal, and when done together, collective, improvisational, with inflection, soulfulness. And it was around this time also, I'm like nine years old, that my mom gave me a book on the great life of Harriet Tubman. Raise your hand if you've heard of Harriet Tubman. Okay. Harriet Tubman is someone who also used the blues, not like I just played there, but the forms of the blues, how one communicates. So it'd be many years later when I got involved in musician, music as a composer and as an instructor and as a teacher that the two worlds came together as I began to really study the life of Harriet Tubman, born in 1822 in Dorchester, Maryland, passed away in 1913 in Auburn, New York. And what was profound about Harriet Tubman was that she used the blues to get messages to other slaves. She used the blues forms to communicate why she worked, whether it was to pass the time, whether it was to envision a better day, a better time, whether it was to mask songs that she sang so that they would have a different and double meaning to other slaves than it did to slave masters. And this is, was profound to me. This was the music that came out of the minds of those who were in bondage. That now is the foundation of all American music, whether it's rock and roll, hip hop and soul, funk, and of course jazz, pop music. Even last night I went down to Broadway to check out the strip on Nashville. I have never seen so much music in like two or three blocks. It's like 40 clubs next to each other, on top of each other, underneath each other. Guess what? All playing some form of the blues. That's the thing that really struck me. I have never seen anything like that. Packed, everybody having a good time, and this music coming pretty much from the same place. Now, how, how did Harriet Tubman use these forms? Well, she used filled cries and blues hollers. Repeat after me. Yeah, yeah, he. Yeah, yeah, he. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, he. Yeah, he. Whoa. whoa, whoa. That sliding and guttural sensibility was one way that slaves communicated to tell someone how they felt in the moment, improvisationally. This is something that we musicians use every time we get on the stage, particularly in the blues form. 
See, all American music kind of sits on top of this self-expression. Harriet Tubman also used work songs because she also worked in work gangs and was a timber cutter with her father. And these songs gave uh, a sense of cooperation, improvisation, call and response, improvised harmony, people working together in time. And if a man or a woman was off, someone can get hurt, injured, maimed, or even killed. So this sense of timing is something that became very important and, and a very special part of American music. Got my letter, oh yeah. Who huh. got my letter, oh yeah. Who huh. got my letter, oh yeah. The people keep it coming and the train done gone. So these songs had rhythm in them. It had improvisation and inflection. And of course, spirituals. Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, many of these who ran from slavery used spirituals to communicate. had double meaning. There's a bomb in Gilead, and they were soulful and improvised. Come to the turn of the 20th century, the blues form again played a very important part in American culture, this form that Harriet Tubman used. Because in the early 20s, we saw the emergence of great blues singers like Bessie Smith, Mamie Smith, Sarah Smith, Trixie Smith. None of these were their real names, <laughs> but they were great stage names. And Mamie Smith being the first one, opened the doors. And what they did was for the first time brought voice to the African-American woman. Because it's through these blues songs that Bessie Smith sang, that Mamie Smith sang, later Billie Holiday, later Ella Fitzgerald, Nina Simone, and on down through history, is what really opened up a way of freedom. First time these songs talked about what was happening behind closed doors, whether it was abuse, whether it was sexuality, whether it was, anything that was happening in the community behind closed doors then became open as an open conversation for a community solution through these songs that Bessie Smith would sing. This was important because Louis Armstrong recorded with Bessie Smith early on and he becoming our greatest trumpet player and our most influential singer, got his start working with people like Bessie Smith because she was so profound in how she sang the blues. She used all of those gifts that Harriet Tubman used, improvisation, her sense of inflection, her sense of feeling, and her sense of vision through the blues. That opened the door to musicians like Duke Ellington and Fletcher Henderson and Count Basie, who came a little bit later in the mid-20s, the late 20s. Duke Ellington, probably our most profound composer, used the blues as the foundation of his music. Matter of fact, all the composers did in this music. The blues, whether it was a 12-bar blues, whether it was the sound of the blues, but it was certainly something that reflected uh, individual expression. So today, what I try to do when I work with young folks is try to give them that sense of power, 
that the ancestors that came before us used, that sense of vision, of cooperation, self-expression, improvisation, acceptance. These are the things that made it possible to free this country. See, the blues was here at the beginning of the founding of this experiment, and it'll be at the end, because the blues is a, a synonymous word to freedom. Even when a musician is playing the blues, they're trying to use freedom of rhythm, freedom of harmony. They're trying to express themselves. They're trying to find a way to reinterpret using their own mindset, he, him or her, instrument or vocally. This you see in all strains of American music. And once we got to the Civil Rights Movement, they used the blues forms for the same reasons that slaves used them, because they too were in bondage. They too needed to find a way to unify and to communicate and express their ideas. Dr. Martin Luther King, someone who understood music very well, said some very profound things about our music. I'd like to read you something that he said in a sermon called Soul of the Movement. An important part of the mass meetings was the freedom songs. In a sense, the freedom songs are the soul of the movement. They are more than just incantations of clever phrases designed to invigorate a campaign. They are as old as the history of the Negro in America. They are adaptations of songs that the slaves sang, the sorrow songs, the shouts for joy, the battle hymns, and the anthems of our movement. I've heard people talk about their beat and rhythm, but we in the movement are inspired by the words, woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom, is a sentence that needs no music to make its point. We sing the freedom songs for the same reason the slaves sang them, because we too are in bondage. And the songs add hope to our determination that we shall overcome black and white together. We shall overcome someday. These songs bound us together, gave us courage together, helped us march together. We could walk toward any Gestapo force. We had cosmic companionship, for we were singing, come by me, Lord, come by me. With this music, a rich heritage from our ancestors who had the stamina and moral fiber to be able to find beauty in broken fragments of music, that's the blues, whose illiterate minds were able to compose eloquently simple expressions of faith and hope and idealism. We can articulate our deepest groans and passionate yearnings and end always on a note of hope that God is gonna help us work it out right here in the South where evil stalks the life of the Negro from the time he is placed in his cradle. Through this music, the Negro is able to dip down deep into the wells of a deeply pessimistic situation and danger-fraught circumstance and bring forth a marvelous, sparkling, fluid optimism. He knows it's still dark in his world, but somehow he finds a ray of light. claps, my snaps.
Thank you. Fantastic. All right, now uh, the next woman up is a young woman called Dalali Ayavor, who is a talented poet, writer, student, and she's one of the young artists that Bob mentioned that um, we got to know through Young Arts, a fabulous organization out of Miami, Florida, that works nationally. So please join me in welcoming Dalali. So first, I just want to take a moment to thank Americans for the Arts for having me here. I'm a little bit overwhelmed, uh, and they've been very supportive of me for many years now, and I really appreciated it. I also want to shout out to my dad, because it's Father's Day. Yay. He promised he would watch me on YouTube, so you better be watching me on YouTube. <laughs> Um, so I wrote a piece to read to you guys today, and it's called Welcome Home. Um, and it's named that after a song by, I'm originally from Ghana, which I will discuss in the piece. Um, but it's originally, it's a song that's originally by a Ghanaian jazz group called Osibisa. And I don't ever remember not knowing this song. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote from the song, and the, the piece is called Welcome Home. You've been gone, it's an empty home. Come on back when you're ready to know. You are always welcome home, welcome home. Two years ago, as part of a pre-pre-quarter life crisis, I found myself taking a year off from liberal arts academia and moving home to Ghana. I wrote once that Africa is my altar, but Ghana is my heart. The, Ghana is the red dust that flows through my veins. Ghana of the sassy schoolgirl in her brown pinafore over faded yellow school uniform shirt, bald-headed and sucking her teeth and stepping in front of your taxi in the middle of Friday traffic and not giving a damn. Ghana, where it is most often 90 degrees and all the food is spicy and the only condiments they make are different kinds of pepper to make it spicier because in Ghana, if your internal body temperature is different from the temperature of the air outside, you're doing it wrong. Ghana, where I learned on my first day as an intern at Creative Storm Networks, women were dying every day from giving birth. I have a sort of knee-jerk reflexive defensiveness about discussing Africa with anyone who is not an African. And I use the term Africa usely, use loosely because if you were to stop that schoolgirl, she would tell you that I am an Obruni, a foreigner, a white man. But I have lived here and I have loved here, and I have a coven of 40 aunties who can tell you differently. But I don't like discussing the continent with people outside of it, because the only image they ever get is that same old, same old hunger and poverty and desperation, and I'm not saying it's not there, but there's a lot more of that in most people's Midwest backyards than they are willing to admit. And you cannot reduce a nation, let alone an entire continent, down to the fact that it's a work in progress. But on my first day as an intern at Creative Storm Networks, an unpaid part-time internship that I got through blatant nepotism, I was confronted with a backyard all my own that I realized I had been ignoring as well. The main project for the year at Creative Storm was the Maternal Health Channel, a year-long 52-episode television series that tracked the state of public health in Ghana, particularly public health resources for expectant mothers. My first assignment was to rewrite the research document that was the foundation of the Maternal Health Channel. 42 pages long and containing a year's worth of mostly anecdotal research from all around the country, reading this document changed me. I read about a remote island village in the northern region with no doctors and no bridges to reach it. 
about teenage girls who drank concoctions of crushed glass darkened with Guinness beer to end their own pregnancies, about women with labor complications on the backs of motorbikes driving in near darkness for 10 hours over not quite roads to find the nearest hospital, C-sections performed in shelters without electricity or running water, my job was supposed to be to rewrite the research so that it was more of a story, but to me, the narrative was all there. Tragedy casts its own roles, villains and heroes alike. The report was a script with deus ex machina, random acts of God, every birth was a miracle. I realized for the first time rewriting that document that I was an Oberni, a foreigner, not because I couldn't speak Chui or could only boil up a passable pot of jollof rice, but because I had never before been enraged by the injustices of the developing world. The massive societal gulf separating me in my air-conditioned office in Accra and a girl my same, my same age who, by circumstance, was slowly dying on the back of a motorbike her whole future reduced to what could be seen in the flicker of its headlights. Potholes, more dirt, darkness. I do not know that the Maternal Health Channel was an artistic endeavor that changed the lives of Ghanaian expectant mothers for the better. By the time that would have happened, I was already back in the United States, back in the bosom of liberal arts academia. What I do know is that working for Creative Storm did for me what all great art does, told me something that I already knew but had no cognizance of knowing. I was not a Ghanaian before the Maternal Health Channel. I was not a Ghanaian before a work of art made me care, truly care, for the land and its people, made me join in on the political debates of wrinkled Ghanaian men five star beers deep, and when I did, they always looked shocked. But behind that shock, there was something deeper. Let's call it hope. I understand that to some, the value of the arts is inscrutable. I understand it because it was not supposed to turn out this way. My parents were a young, black, duly afroed intellectual couple in the 70s. The kind of couple just time specific enough that it would make great fodder for a post-2000 sitcom. My dad was an import from Ghana who dogged my mom into a first date at what turned out to be a gay bar. And my mother was a young North Carolinan from a religious family whose choice of computer science as a major gave her a break from the racism of her upbringing in the civil rights era South. She was one of the only non-male, non-Asian people in her program. And she's often told me of the signs in the computer labs that read, no food allowed, being amended by a note that said, chips and coke, okay, no rice. Somehow, those genes spawned my sister and I, one writer, one actress, with barely the skills to solve a long division problem, let alone code software between the two of us. I can see at times that my father struggles to see the value in what I do, to quantify the value of expression. But I ask, in a world that we know increasingly more about and simultaneously understand less, what is the sense in making sense? I write because it makes me in tune with immediacy. Peter Matheson on a trip to my high school once said, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Your life is moving very, very quickly. And it is that dogma that informs my writing life. Art renders me down to what is essential, makes me bear witness to the everyday, ensures that I am living. It also reminds me of the smallness of myself, lets me know that it is impossible to have the answers for everything. Here is what I do know. Last week, I was in Accra, Ghana, the week before that in Portland, Oregon. I am standing here today, straddling so many time zones that I am a narcoleptic black hole. <laughs> so I thank God that I have poetry to keep me sane. This is a country where sending a child to school is no guarantee that they will survive the day living. There are now weekly reminders of this. 
So I thank God that I have poetry to keep me sane. I have never felt more aware than when I am bearing witness to beauty, when the absorption of art sharpens my vision and opens my pores, purifies me, fills my mouth with a clear and sweet taste that I have been missing, and I know with certainty that if something can move me like that, make me that much more aware of living, force me to pay attention, then anything is possible. So I thank God that I have poetry to keep me sane. And so should you. Thank you. I think you did okay. <laughs> so uh, to round us out, please now join me in welcoming uh, Carla Derlikoff, who's an internationally known opera singer, as well as a cultural envoy for the US Department of State, as well as being a recipient of the Sphinx Organization's Medal of Excellence. Please welcome Carla to the stage. Hola. I'm so excited to be here today, and it's really an honor to be among such incredible colleagues. Let's give them another round of applause. One of the things I love the most about being a performer is the collaborative aspect of it and being able to find yourself in a new setting, in a new city, among a new audience with new colleagues and to constantly be inspired by the work of others. That is one of the greatest gifts of my job. I want to start today by reading a quote that's very dear to me. You must systematically cause confusion. That is what releases creativity. Anything that is contradictory creates life. This was written by Salvador Dali. And it's special to me because I feel that my life is contradictory. Being here at the conference the last few days, one of the first questions that I've been asked is, where are you from? Well, if where are you from means where do you live, I live just outside of Philadelphia. If it means where are you originally from, I'm from Michigan. Most people look at my last name and look at me and think, you don't seem like you're from Michigan. Well, my father is Bulgarian, my mother is Mexican. The whole question of identity, who are we? Where are we from? This is something that's plagued me for a long time as I've tried to fit in to different groups and understand myself better. And I came to an important realization a few years ago, and that is, does it matter? I think what I've learned as a singer in my travels is that essentially we're all the same. We all feel the same emotions. We all want to be happy. We all have a need to cry sometimes. We fear different things and we experience joy. But what's interesting about this is our desire to communicate those feelings. I have found that no matter where I go, we all share that in common. And communication in particular has been something that's been at the root of my upbringing. As a child, my parents were quite clever. They decided that since they didn't speak a common language, they would teach me their languages and then I could translate. So <laughs> <laughs> a daily occurrence for me was my mother telling me in Spanish, go tell dad dinner's ready, and my going down to the basement and in Bulgarian telling my father, dinner's ready, and my dad saying, no, tell your mom I need another five minutes, and I'd go back up and tell her in Spanish. This is how I grew up. English was a third language for me. And as I grew and discovered music, what was very interesting was when I found singing. Singing was the marriage 
between language and music. So I was hooked at the age of 14. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And I became obsessed with learning everything I could about all of the various languages. And as I did, it was around the time I was in graduate school, a very funny thing happened. I went and rescued a dog from the SPCA. And I will never forget those first moments with my dog, Jesse, AKA Tiger. I like to call him Tiger to boost his ego a bit. <laughs> we all need that sometimes. I remember picking him up and trying to get him in the car and thinking, what do I do? It's the first time in my life I was at a complete loss of how to communicate. Do I tell him in English? Do I push a button? Do I, what am I supposed to do? And through this relationship with this animal, I learned a very important lesson that has meant a lot to me as a singer. And that is that actually, sometimes we don't need any language. Sometimes we don't even need any sound. It's just having an awareness. It's just being open. And as time has gone by, I actually think that Jesse can communicate with me and I can communicate with him probably better than I can with most humans. <laughs> so it's certainly been an interesting lesson for me. But I come back to this idea of communication and why. Why are we so obsessed with communicating? Why is it so important and fundamental to us? And I've thought about this a lot. The answer that I have come up with is because we have a desire inside of ourselves to share, to share the human experience, to share what it means to go through all of these emotions. And somehow, through sharing, Maybe we don't feel so alone. Maybe in that sharing, we understand that we're all in it together. The arts. We're here today to talk about the transformative power of arts in society. And to me, I feel that the arts provide us with an opportunity not only to share our common human experience, but in doing so, to celebrate what we all have in common. It's an opportunity to unite, not just as a society, but as a human race. For me, it's been a great joy to be a singer. And on a personal level, I can tell you that I didn't go to a lot of baseball games as a kid. I sat down and watched operas with my dad, or I listened to Tonya de la Negra and all kinds of wonderful Mexican popular singers with my mom. And it was about around three, that I saw my first opera, which was Carmen, and I was hooked. It became a lifelong dream and my favorite game to play, to uh, sort of wave my hands in these invisible castanets and dress one brother up like the bull and the other like the bullfighter. <laughs> and I loved it. And in that way, the arts were a constant thread through my upbringing when I was able to go on as a professional singer and make my debut in this role, you can only imagine that it was a real dream come true for me. I grew up in Michigan in a school that did not have a lot of hope, let's say. There were 400 students in my freshman class. There were 175 of us that graduated and certainly less than a dozen who went on to college. But what kept me through all of that and certainly what's gotten me here is the fact that we had a wonderful choral program in our school. We had a director that inspired us. And I always had this idea, both through that educational program and through my parents and their story as immigrants, that in America, anything is possible and we should all dream big. So it is my honor now to be able to share with you one of my favorite songs, which is the Habanera from Carmen song I sang as a little girl and now I get to sing it for you. However, I am going to ask that you join me because I'm going to need some help with this one. So, you may know the tune. Um, I'm going to ask that we split up into two groups here and I'm going to really need some strong voices. How many of you have ever aspired to be opera singers? <laughs> Not everyone? Come on guys, come on. Well, this is your big chance. So, um, 
We're going to split up into two groups, and I'm just going to need a little bit of a ba bum bum bum, and I'll show you how it goes. This is my wonderful pianist, Megan Gale, who's with us today. Let's give her a round of applause. Yeah. So why don't we just do the ba bum ba bum just so they hear it? So we'll call this side Team A, but Team A seems to vastly outnumber Team B. So we're going to need some strong voices on Team B. So Team A, here we go. These are your notes. So let's hear it. Ba bum bum bum. Awesome. You guys are good. OK, Team B, show them you can do it. Come on, guys. So Team B. Ba bum bum bum. Great. That was a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> well, let's try it. So I'm going to cue you guys in. And I want to also thank Marcus for being willing to join in on this song. The more the merrier. OK. gave us very, very strict instructions for how we were to run this session. And he said, uh, you know, the panel is called The Power of Art to Transform Society. And the question that I want the four of you to tackle is, what do you think the single biggest issue facing American society today is, and how can the arts solve it? <laughs> so no pressure. <laughs> Um, actually, I'd rather start with a, with a different sort of question, which is, um, w Carla told us how she got to know the habanera, but you guys met, the three of you, for the first time yesterday, and as we were each rehearsing what we were doing, Marcus, you sort of jumped up and said, oh wait, I know that song, and you had a different way of knowing the habanera. Will you let yeah. us know how you know the song? Well, I learned it from the Dorothy Dandridge film, Carmen Jones. <laughs> <laughs> So I used to watch that film all the time. I was just so blown away by the cast, uh, by Dorothy Dandridge, by um, Harry Belafonte. And I have to say, I was, it was the first time I had seen like an all black cast singing opera. And the, the music was based on the, the actual Bizet music. And so I, was, I learned all the songs. I taught them to my daughters. And, and then I actually finally uh, <laughs> heard the actual Carmen. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is where it comes from. <laughs> because Carmen Jones is all in English. Right. And so I bought the score and I'm like, oh. <laughs> and so it, was, it made me really appreciate um, the actual original. And then I actually went even deeper into the piece and learned where that came from. And it was based on, I believe, a poem called The Gypsies. It's based yeah. on a book a by book. Daddy May, actually. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I love history, and I love finding the roots of where things came from so that I can articulate it and, and have a stronger appreciation, and, and then in turn, as Carla said, share that. 
So you met, I mean, part of what you said, Marcus, I think is so interesting is that you remember sort of seeing yourself in a work of art and that in the Dorothy Dandridge, seeing this all black cast was a very important moment. And Carly, you talked a little bit about sort of your own identity and seeing it in Bulgarian opera, seeing it in Mexican music, seeing all of that. And Dalali, you said something, and I didn't quite get it right, so I'm gonna misquote you in front of you, That's which okay. is a terrible thing to do. <laughs> but you said that poetry and great art tells you something you already knew, but you hadn't said yet, or something like that. Yeah. Can you talk about a moment that you've sort of saw yourself in a work of art, or there was a work of art that you experienced and you sort of had that aha moment, that, that recognition of something in yourself? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's something that's universal with all arts of work that I really, really love, um, especially with writing, is hearing somebody say something and realizing that it's something so fundamental to yourself and you've always felt that way, but you've never heard anybody articulate it before. Um, trying to think of a specific example. I don't know if you've ever read The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon. It's one of my favorite books. Um, and there's just something really beautiful about transience um, and about family staying stationary even though time and place changes. That's kind of like a theme in that book that, that really, really resonates with me. Yeah. That's fantastic. Carly, you had talked a little bit about the way that art and music specifically can work when you're sort of crossing languages, crossing nations, crossing identities, and you do some work with the State Department. Why, I mean, I think many people in this room have sort of opinions about why the art should be part of international diplomacy, but why was that something that you were drawn to? Why as an opera singer, when this opportunity came up, did you say, yes, that's something that I really want to do, that's something that's core to who I am and what I'm doing? Absolutely, well, two reasons for that. Uh, number one, I love work that's outside of the box. and. In the opera world, we're often going from one gig to the other. You know, uh, you're cast, you go, you work with the other singers, you produce the production, and then you pack up and go on to the next thing. The State Department work is unusual in that it's totally outside of the box. And when I was first approached about it, they, I think, wanted to be very respectful of my tradition in the opera and you know they asked me what kind of work I'd want to do and I was ready to roll up my sleeves and get in there so I said you know let's go work with some kids let's work with perhaps some kids that would not have access easily to music one of the great things about singing is that it is free so it's a chance for people to express themselves musically to get those emotions going and all of that free of charge and we actually went in Mexico my first sort of assignment, should I choose to accept it, was uh, <laughs> down in Mexico uh, with a group of kids that were underprivileged and many of them were orphaned. So we got them together, sort of formed a, a, a new chorus, um, and what was very interesting was it was not with the intention that these kids were going to go on to be opera singers or any kind of singers or musicians. It was with the intention of giving them hope that anything was possible. And when you sing, you really need to have that confidence. You need to have you know, something to say to get up in front of a group and put yourself out there. What I saw in that week or so of classes was those kids gain that confidence. As time went by, um, I had recommended them for a number of other things. They ended up opening for some pretty big singers, including Bocelli. And a few years later, these kids that nobody had really given a lot of attention to, they won a prize at the White House called the Coming Up Taller Award and went to Washington, D.C. Those kids are now looking at going to college. They're looking at becoming doctors and lawyers and teachers. And they say it's because of the music. That's fantastic. Marcus, you, although you don't work for the federal government, you are now doing some work with local government in San Francisco, and you've recently joined the San Francisco Arts Commission that you've been on for about a year now, is that right? Mm -hmm. And as an artist, why was it important to you to sort of do your civic duty and sort of step up and be a part of government? I mean, why was that important? Yeah, out of everything you do, you're a teacher, you're a band leader, you're a composer, you're a performer, you're gigging, you're doing all of this. Why did you also feel the need as an artist to sort of step up and say, I want to be a part of my hometown government? Well, I think artists should be a voice in, in, in the political environment. I've been in San Francisco for 18 years. Um, I love my city. 
Um, I love the values of my city, you know, and uh, I, I love the people of my city. Although it's going through a lot of changes, the, the decisions that are allowed on the, in the capacity I am allows me to have a voice on how the arts caretake, the arts commission and the city caretake the arts in our communities. And so at first I was a little apprehensive because I was like, I wanna be an agitator. I don't wanna be <laughs> in the machine, you know? Uh, I wanna actually fight the machine, right? But um, then I saw it as a, 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 a opportunity to learn how civic work happens, how money is is uh, actually allocated and raised and supported of, of the community of artists. I've been there for a year. I'm on the Community Arts and Education Committee and also the Street Artists Committee. So I get an opportunity to actually work with the artists. Um, I, it's been a big support for my career before I became on the Arts Commission. So it's something I think it's important that artists are part of the conversation because artists tend to come up with creative ways to solve problems. You know, they, artists don't just immediately reach for the hammer to solve problems. They come up with ways to, for people to work together. They are always looking for the beauty in things that seem to be troublesome or, or things that aren't happening right. The artists tend to want to work with other people. They tend to be open-minded. And so I think that it's a good thing to have art, artists on these type of commissions in, in the civic role. And so, those are the ways that I've tried to express myself and be a part of that larger conversation. That's fantastic. And Dalali, you're busy, I think, being a full-time student in addition yeah. to your writing life. Mm -hmm. And you're currently a student at a college that's up till now, I think you may change this, but up till now your college has been famous for one thing. And yeah. what was that? Steve Jobs went there for a year and then he dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> and what did he study while he was there? Calligraphy. Excellent. Now, <laughs> you, <laughs> you were there studying what? I'm going to be an anthropology major. And do you yet, I mean, this is one of those terrible questions that I'm sure your aunties <laughs> bother you with all the time when yeah. you go home. Do you have a sense in terms of your work in Ghana with the maternal public health issues, the studying you're doing of anthropology, the writing you've done, do you have a vision for what you might be doing in five years and ten years? I don't know if I have a vision for what I'm going to be doing in five years or ten years, except hopefully not dropping out and auditing classes on calligraphy. <laughs> but I will say that one of the best things about being an anthropology major thus far is that it's really doing for me what working for the Maternal Health Channel did for me. Um, this past semester I took a class called the Anthropology of Globalization, and kind of zooming out and seeing from a macro view the economic and developmental theory uh, factors that go in into sustaining the third world and suppressing it. It was the first time that I ever understood why my life was the way it was for so much growing up in the third world as a child. And it was really amazing to kind of see that there's an empirical way to live through your own life experience and to see it from a completely different guise. Um, and so I think that's something that's that I'm really valuing about my education. And I think that it's really informing my writing life in really, really interesting ways. And it just makes me more invested in writing. It makes me more invested in Ghana. And I, I definitely am planning eventually to move back to Ghana. And I would really love to create more of a vibrant art scene there because there are people who are so talented, but there's not very many resources, which is the reason why I moved away. I went to Interlochen Arts Academy and I wanted to be a writer and I didn't think I could do it there, so I left. But I know so many people who are so artistically inclined there, and they just do not have the community. There's no support, there's no resources. And that's something that I would really love to provide for people. Because, you know, it's like I said with the Maternal Health Channel, there's all these stories that you don't know about. And unless you have the opportunity to let people tell those stories and to make people care, things aren't going to get better. So, yeah, it's really important to me. Um, I don't know how many people got up this morning and read through the New York Times, uh, but if you did, there's, a, there's an odd piece in it uh, entitled Poetry Who Needs It. And there are a couple lines from it that I've spent a lot of time, it's a very odd piece if you want to read it, but there are a couple lines I've spent some time this morning sitting with um, that go, the dirty secret of poetry is that it is loved by some, loathed by many, and bought by almost no one. <laughs> There are still those odd sorts, no doubt disturbed and unsocial torturers of cats, who love poetry nonetheless. 
They come in ones and twos to the difficult monologues of Browning or to the shadowy quatrains of Emily Dickinson or the awful but cheerful poems of Elizabeth Bishop, finding something there not in the novel or the pop song. And each of you has dedicated your lives. Well, hold on, hold on. We'll make it okay. <laughs> Boo the New York Times. Um, but each of you has dedicated yourselves to an art form that isn't consumed by the same number of people that Miley Cyrus or Justin Bieber or any of those other more relevant, you know, I'm showing how old I am because that's the best I can do in terms of coming up with. So as we sort of bring this section of the program to a close, the question I have for each of you is if an American didn't know the blues, if an American didn't read poetry, if an American didn't listen to classical music, what are they missing? What is absent from their lives if they don't know the thing that you guys have devoted so much time and energy to? So I don't know, should we start with Carla? Well, for me it's very simple, beauty. Classical music is beautiful. There is a gorgeous aesthetic to it. In particular, opera, the reason that I was drawn to it is bel canto, beautiful singing. When I first heard opera live, I didn't just hear it, I felt the vibrations on my skin. I got goosebumps. It was a visceral experience. And that is something that I hope that everyone in America and everyone throughout the world will experience. Marcus, what, what, what do Americans miss by not knowing the blues? Well, I don't think there's anything more American than the blues, because the blues was here in the beginning. And the thing about the blues, it's like the Greek tragedy. You have like triumph and tragedy, you know, triumph, and tragedy, right? You have that sort of dichotomy in the blues. Because often the blues might sound like it's a struggle, or someone's going through a, a very painful struggle, but it's not always sad. It's really how someone gets through that struggle, how they are able to manage, and how they're able to be hopeful. And as Carla said, how they're able to find the beauty in things that seem to be troublesome or, or not so beautiful. And so the, the blues is a reflection of who we are individually, who we are culturally, collectively. It was in the beginning of this country. It's still here. It informs all the music that we listen to, whether it's improvisational music or written music. There's a sense of self-expression, collective cooperation, um, and this guttural sensibility that Dr. Martin Luther King talked about and this personal relationship that we see through Louis Armstrong's music and Billie Holiday's music. So if not knowing the blues is not knowing what it is to be an American. And so, Delali, I'll, I'll give you the last one. I'll give you the title of the article, Poetry, Who Needs It? <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody needs it. I, I've definitely had people before tell me, you know, I don't like poetry, and that just breaks my heart. Number one, because I think people have a very narrow definition of art in general. You know, they think it's fine art, it's something in a museum. I don't think that's necessarily true. One of my favorite poets is Jean-Michel Basquiat, and he was a graffiti artist, and he wrote tags all over New York City. I mean, that's poetry too. And I think the value of poetry for me, and I think this could be true for a lot of people, is escapism. Something that's really difficult for me to reconcile with every day is that I will only ever live as myself and I can only ever have my own personal experience. But reading allows you to live as many lives as you can consume. And that's a really beautiful thing. And I don't know why anyone would hold themselves back from that, so. I think that's fantastic. So we didn't want to end just with sort of four people sitting in chairs talking. So I'm going to ask Megan if she can come back out on stage. And um, for anyone who doesn't know Megan, she's not only a classical pianist, but she's also an educator at Vanderbilt. Um, so Megan is back on stage. And, the, yay. and then we're, we're going to end. This is our gift, our Father's Day gift to Clay. This is his vision, his second baby. So uh, hopefully, no pressure again. <laughs> Um, and Carla and Marcus, the, the piece of music that we picked is a piece of music that each of you performs. Marcus, you said once a week? Just about. Just about <laughs> once a week. Carla, this is a piece that's in your repertory. This is the first time that is I'm this doing this. Yeah, but I've, I've heard it. It's, it's yeah. something that's always inspired me very much. 
That's fantastic. And then, Dalali, you've added a few lines by the late, wonderful, extraordinary Dr. Maya Angelou yes. uh, that is going to come up. So I'm not going to tell you guys anything more, but I'm going to invite Marcus to pick up his bass, Carla to take her place by the piano, Dalali to join Carla, and all of you to join me in thanking these four, three artists, four artists, one last time. B flat, right? <laughs> Did we decide what key? <laughs> yeah, we're doing it. It's a G. G. So as written. Oh, as G. Shelby, Megan Gale, Carla Durlikoff, and Delalia. So these are wonderful people, and uh, I think that was a fantastic way to close us out. So um, I want to, uh, yes, let's do it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, uh, you were all here for the Ben Folds conversation, and uh, I'll just point out that Let It Shine is from the Kumbaya era, and uh, uh, you know, it still works. It still works, and I, I didn't know they were going to do that. Um, what I, uh, I, I want to thank um, all of the artists here uh, to be, for being here, uh, for being part of the arts, and for making the arts an integral part 
um, of, uh, of their communities and all of you in your communities. We've learned about having a blues pathway in our, in our lives, as I was thinking from Marcus. We learned about paying attention uh, from Dalali. We, we have learned, I think, in Carla's work that uh, um, we make everything possible for people. And I think that that is, is a, a lesson for all of us to take away. And Jamie, what a great uh, facilitator and community uh, worker and somebody who's helping you do that all across the country. So four great people. Um, I want to also thank our local host here, the Metro, Met, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, and Jen, who I think is around here somewhere. There she is. I, uh, I want to thank our 166 panelists and experts who we have, have uh, had here over the last few days. I want to thank our Americans for the Arts staff for the job that they did. I think, uh, I think I saw Clay running out the door to, uh, to catch a plane, but this is evaluation time. This was his first conference with us. How did he do? All the staff worked really hard to make this uh, uh, happen. And I also want to thank uh, all of you. What I like to say, and you've heard me say it before, is that you are important. Um, and through your work and what we just heard here, you help there be uh, better children better towns, a better nation, and a better world. So I look forward to seeing you all in Chicago, and in bidding you farewell, I'm happy to invite here the, uh, I've been waiting all weekend for this, you know, for the, uh, uh, the Eucadelics, a Nashville favorite to play you out of the ballroom and on your way home in true Music City style. Happy Father's Day, safe travels, the Eucadelics. Buttercup, we're gonna heat this party up. Show the chaperone right out the door. Pucker up, cause that's what lips are for. First we'll pack, then we'll smooth. Cuddle up and hoochie cooch. Kiss it till I kiss her, both get sore. Pucker up, cause that's what lips are for. American art right there, kids.
night I was quite a sight and as far as I can guess I met a lady named Big Mama Cause her name's now tattooed on my chest Big Mama, oh Big Mama You're the one for me Gonna get you back Big Mama But I just don't know And I was off and she was getting on We ducked the hollow up all aboard The break and let her go And she was gone On Thursday evening clocking out as I was leaving Thought I saw her standing there She waved goodbye giving me a smile As she climbed into a taxi And she left without a care Big mama, oh big mama You're the one for me Gonna get you back big mama But I just don't know Where you could be Big mama, oh big mama